Hello and welcome to MyTech U, the April 2017 edition where today we're going to talk about avoiding process development pitfalls or as uh, Michael Frasconi who's joining us uh, would say you never pass the baton backwards. So we're going to talk about that today and um, uh, this is something that every organization uh, uh, at least in our customers that we've worked with that struggles with. Um, even if they're great at process, it's an ongoing uh, effort to keep it compliant and to continually adapt and evolve. And we're fortunate we have um, two of our uh, folks on our team joining us on the call. Michael's leading the presentation. He's our process improvement director. Uh, we also have uh, Emily Schwarzkopf who's on the team and helps uh, with process improvement in our organization as well. So. Um, without further ado, I want to say welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. And Emily, thank you for your time. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, as the presentation goes on, if you have any questions, uh, please enter them uh, on the question pane. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll connect with you offline if you answer any questions. So, Michael, please uh, introduce yourself and take it away. Thank you, Nate. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As you can see on the screen, I am the Process Improvement Director here at MyTech. I have been here for about four and a half years uh, on this process journey. Today, I'm going to jump right into what our agenda is. We're going to cover the requirements and methodology of process while at the same time addressing pitfalls. Um, as I said, I've been at this for four and a half years here, and we have learned a lot. You can learn a lot in a four-year time frame. It's much like uh, college education. So normally when I am presenting, I, I like to engage with the audience and it's a little diff different with a webinar, but um, usually it's about just kind of getting a feel for uh, people. Um, most of the time we have people in these, some, these webinars and presentations that have either begun process development or are engaged in some level of process development. Uh, they have some idea about what they want to do, but they may be struggling with, you know, how to get it all together, how to get this, this, um, this boat rowing in the right direction um, and also you know just really to address uh, ownership of process so we'll get into some of that with the requirements um, and again uh, we've learned a lot and hopefully some of these things are pretty basic but I think they're they are needed to be pointed out because if you don't uh, have that present of mind you will uh, end up with some pitfalls um, let me just jump into um, some of the requirements so the first thing I, I, I'd like to talk about is, you know, there's, there's two layers of this strategy. Um, so in, when we talk about requirements, first of all, from a business standpoint, if you look at the diagram, this is from our Entrepreneurial Operating System, EOS, from Gino Wickman's book, Traction. And um, it, is, it is how we um, strategically set goals in the organization and achieve um, directives. So if you look at the, the, the diagram there, process is one of the equal components of what our business strategy is. Um, again, that has to be in play. The process has to be part of it uh, in order to um, have success with it. So if you see my first success point there is leadership buy-in. Uh, when I joined MyTech four and a half years ago, uh, our CEO, Leap, went to our board of directors and said, and, and at that time we were only about 32 employees, and said, you know, I want to hire this full-time uh, person uh, in process. And they were like, how, how are we doing this at 30 people? Why do we need it? And he just said, you know, we've got he believed in the strategy. He believed that we were going to do it. And he got buy-in at the leadership level, and I have been supported ever since. So success, really, in the first place was to have leadership behind me um, and really understanding that process does play a key role in the organization and having ownership to it. And I'll get into some of the ownership things as we move forward. But once you have the, the company strategy in alignment, it's we now need for process an implementation strategy around process. So success really means a couple of things in the requirement area that leadership is buying into it and that we actually have a way to produce process and engage with process that's consistent and will and will work for the organization. A couple things that so, we've learned. I'm going Michael, to, yep. for, forgive me for interjecting, but you mentioned something that I think is uh, um, something that I'll say that like what's one of the whys for process and why did we engage on this process journey and just what are some of the results of that? Um, and so my tech was what help you said what thirty some employees when you started, Michael? Yes. Um, yes. And, and, and today, so four and a half years later, uh, yeah, we're around 85 employees, yeah. um, 85, 90, somewhere in that ballpark, and uh, it, it, we wouldn't have been able to grow. Um, and now, don't get me wrong, we have our challenges still that we're continually working to improve, but we would not have been able to sustain that growth or, or handle that growth if it weren't for uh, process being a key component of, of our operational um, 
kind of just method. So I uh, just wanted to comment on that because since you mentioned the 30 employee mark, I thought it was good to put a reference in there that in the four and a half years, you know, you've helped us nearly triple in size uh, through, through execution process. Thank you. I couldn't have said that better myself. Thank you, Nate. Um, yes, that is absolutely um, part of the whole deal. You can't scale. And one of the other points that um, I can mention is that we are also in three lo locations now, which has made process extremely important. Part of that also ties to our vision and mission, and I'll get, I think there's a slide later that mentions that. But um, our, our vision is to um, um, create the best IT experience. So um, if we have good, consistent process, we are delivering things consistently, and that will, that will um, tie together really well. Um, again, um, let's talk about the pitfalls here in strategy. So if we really, I mean, weren't clear about our outcome, we're going to be running in a, million, in a bunch of different directions. So having clarity around that and using our EOS, this business implementation strategy, is a 90-day a quarterly goal setting process, which you see here. It really allowed us a framework to, to have um, expected um, outcome uh, documented around what are we trying to do and what is it, what is it we're trying to solve. So we really want to make sure we're clear and, and that is really a lot of dialogue when you're planning and really pulling and doing discovery, which I'll get into. Um, and there's also one thing that I've learned as process director here at MyTech. Um, is that there is a, a common misconception about what process is and a lot of people have varying degrees of how they would like to work with process and so we really want to be clear on process being a living breathing asset and that is something you engage in and that is something I have it has been my mantra since uh, joining the company four and a half years ago um, what I also um, want to just make sure we're clear is knowing when to start and what your quarterly goals are and how to how to be very finite about them. Otherwise, process can be an ongoing exercise of, of solving problems that really doesn't relate to the overall goal. So clarity is critical, and that's something that we always want to be, be very front and center on. Um, another requirement which is key is about process owner and driver. Um, so like I said, when Leaf joined, or when Leaf and I met four and a half years ago, he went to the board of directors and said, I found an individual that I believe will fit this. And, and uh, through this process, um, my job has been full time. So my whole entire existence here at MyTech is related to process development and engagement. In fact, um, as you've heard us talk about our growth, we have hired another um, employee in the process department, and that is Emily. If you can pop in, pipe in and say hello, Emily, and just uh, give a quick introduction on what you do here. Hello, yes, my, uh, my name is Emily Schwartzkopf. I've been with MyTech Partners for about two years now. Um, I have kind of a dual role here at MyTech. Um, I am 50% onboarding project management, um, and actually there was a whole process that we developed for onboarding, which we then have used to kind of give off to, the, uh, to our branch offices so that we all are onboarding our customers in a um, similar fashion. Um, so that really came in handy as a, as a training tool, um, as well as when I was first learning as well. Um, and then the other half of my role is uh, process improvement here at MyTech as well. I, I work with Michael to um, kind of uh, develop new processes and um, kind of maintain and update our existing ones as well. Thank you, Emily. Um, so again, um, so back to, uh, go ahead, Nate. Yeah, I was just going to say as a, as a comment on that is that, you know, on this particular uh, section when you're saying having a process owner and driver, um, the, the one, as, a, as a manager in the organization, as someone who um, has other primary responsibilities, uh, process and documentation of process and those kind of things are, there are, there are things that I always uh, want to do but they tend to be a back burner issue because I'm working with customers or vendors or uh, and things like that. So or or my team. So th this piece to me and the value to me as a as a as a manager has been to the fact that I can collaborate with someone who owns it and is their primary responsibility. And that's that's this one thing has made all the difference in the world uh, for our team is that it wasn't. Uh, every single manager's back burner issue. Uh, it ended up being a front burner issue for Michael and Emily and, and enabled the, the manager to spend the time they did have to collaborate as opposed to having to own it and drive it. 
So it, it, this is a key piece because not, not only just to, for the value of creating the process, but the value of freeing up the opportunity cost of freeing up time of your management and leadership and the different department heads or leaders in the organization that are responsible for these pieces uh, to help improve their teams and the operations as well. So um, that's, I think, the, the, that's what I want to just hit from, from a management perspective, at least, you know, how it affected me personally. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, in, when I'm presenting in a live audience situation, it's, it's a lot easier to see these four traits of your um, driver and owner. I, these are uh, something that I think describe me pretty well. Um, but I'm, what I'm saying is in process ownership, because it is, it is that, that challenge of always doing what we say we do and making sure things are current and that they, there's good engagement and dialogue about how we do things, you do need an owner driver. Um, and that person must have the bandwidth within the availability to be fully focused. So when I was hired, you know, this is my full-time job, and as as we've grown three times our size since then, we have added Emily to my team, and the two of us now are, are still in, um, you know, we're full-on process. Emily, as, as you heard, 50% of her time, but the other 50% of her time, she's actually working in a process. So it um, it is all about ownership, as Nate said. So if you have um, thought about, you know, having current managers to do this kind of stuff, you're going to see that third pitfall to avoid process will always take a back seat to firefighting and that that's one major thing and that's the point Nate was making is if you don't have someone who owns it that can really keep ahead of it and, and drive it it will take a back seat and you're going to uh, you know it will not be the driver of the organization that it should so again Whoever you have identified, um, I've had people actually ask me um, in presentations, well, how do you do that? How do you get, how do you make sure someone has a bandwidth? You actually have to take that leap of faith. If this is important, you will have to have someone to drive it with the, the backbone of the company and the leadership team supporting that individual or those individuals. Um, you will be able to um, move forward. Make that the priority and you won't have the issue about bandwidth. Um, some of the pitfalls that I've learned I think are really, um, you know, I'm, I'm a lion. If you've ever heard of Dr. Larry Little's Make a Difference, uh, that's another uh, my tech you we do. Um, but I've, I've learned a lot about my personality in this and, and my, my own characteristics as passionate and tenacious I may be. I also have to be able to be objective and remain objective. So the process owner really has to take a, a high level approach to things and be very objective and don't and I always tell people, you know, I love to create process and really produce some really visual diagrams and documentation that, are, that make it as clear as we can get from A to Z, end to end processes. And I tell people, tell me my baby's ugly. Tell them that, you know, tell me my process needs work. I do encourage that because engaging in, in good dialogue around process is, is how you improve it. Um, so I've learned to, to just take that step back before, I mean, and my, my, my passion in me sometimes tends to always jump to the conclusion, but let, I have to let people express what they feel about things and what they see of things in their interpretation of things so that we can connect the dots. So remaining objective is a critical feature, um, and it, it will help you avoid that, take, getting yourself too personally inside of the process. Um, and also, company politics are going to happen wherever you are. Do not play favoritism when you're creating processes. You are not creating processes to help any particular individual. You are processes there to streamline and make the company run efficiently and provide and meet your vision as ours is to provide the best IT experience. Um, but again, uh, process has to always be front and center and the only way for that for me is that's because it is my job to make sure it's front and center so I can let managers go and firefight and deal with exceptions and and we can always have dialogue after an exception is is, is uh, executed um, to to revisit the process and make sure we've got everything covered so it, it's that's it, it and again like Nate said this is probably the most important component of successful process management development is ownership and Emily and I are those owners here at my tech so Michael let me offer yeah, uh, let me, I, I want to offer so I've talked as you as you're moving along here I've actually worked with a couple customers where we've talked about process and uh, I have seen some success in um, in shorter term initiatives to like for instance the company that we were working with um, they were working to uh, change out their main line of business software right the base of the software that had the that, that touched nearly every aspect of their organization and they did a, a team initiative that was department based where they collaborated on a weekly basis to to 
document and get some um, process defined. So mm -hmm. I, I have, the reason why I say that is I want to kind of pair in contrast because I've definitely had feedback from organizations like, yeah, well, the managers of every team owns that part. And, and that can work to some extent, and we have seen it work, especially around shorter term initiatives. But the, the, uh, what, we've, what I've seen is that sometimes that ends up being like, uh, it's, it's, it's a one-time thing. It's not a living, breathing, dynamic, adaptable, right. Um, right. enabling the organization to evolve, um, especially because if departments are only really responsible for their departments, well, what about the interaction between departments? How do we make sure that there's bridges built between the silos? And those are the things that, that I've seen organizations be successful with um, having certain initiatives, but the long-term overall engagement and, and enablement that process can do for an organization um, is, is where I think it gets challenging if you don't have someone to really own it like you're talking about, Michael. So, um, so I, ju I just want to give that feedback. So those are some customers that I've seen and worked with yep. process from a conversation perspective um, that, that cause it's not an all or none. You can make progress on process in different ways. It's just I think the long-term uh, driver and building of bridges and, and enabling the entire organization versus an individual department um, re does require some ownership. So. Sure, and and let me respond to that. Just so my interpretation of that, and what I see is that that's great when managers say have these initiatives. What you end up with are great procedures that are within those silos, right? It's 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 when you take process to this level with an owner and driver that you're actually able to work silo to silo and focus on handoffs and things like that a little differently. So I think yep. that by putting that owner driver, and you could actually utilize maybe all of those initiatives that are out there in play and help them connect the dots because they're not going to be able to do it as well as an owner driver. I think that's just yep. where it comes from. So yeah, I, yep. I think we're in lockstep there. So let me let me go into the methodology now. I really want to just, and, and I talk about this all the time, um, which is really critical. You want to have a simple methodology to implement, right? We talked in the introduction about that we would be talking about this methodology. Um, so in order to, to have a closed loop system, I have um, worked between Six Sigma and ITIL and my experience in both, and I've sort of come into my tech with a simpler version. So imagine when I came into the company at 30 employees, how do you take a small business that is, is, is growing fast, has aggressive vision, or even just a business that needs to have consistency and, and proper um, um, throughput, you want to be able to engage uh, folks in a way that there is uh, control around it. Now we can go in, I could have come in here and taught Six Sigma Demaic, which is define, measure, analyze, improve, control, and got into all the, uh, the, the iterations and, and, and pieces of that and tried to teach a, a, a very in-depth methodology when in fact all I really needed to do was come in and show a simple uh, approach to process that would engage folks and and that's what we've done so I've, I've broken it down into just this four cycle loop and I'll, I'll get into the success and uh, pitfalls of each of these um, but at a high level what is a discovery it's 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 conversation it's dialogue you you need to if it's either for creating or establishing a line in the sand and as is process to understand it and document it you're going out and you're asking people sometimes you're in a room with a lot of people sometimes it's one on one but you do um, um, very um, detailed discovery and you cover all areas, you, you figure out who are all the stakeholders, then you go to documentation and you actually put it all together. Make sure whatever tools you use are consistent so that the process output documentation is notably that, um, so it's unique. Um, I think that always helps. Once you have deployed a, iter an iteration of the process, then you work on compliance from both a proactive and reactive standpoint. And I'll get in again what the success and pitfalls of these are. In continuous improvement, you use a robust change management system, which I will talk a little bit about. So let me just jump into discovery. So, and Michael, uh, real yes. quick, so um, for the attendees, uh, you do have a couple attachments to the, uh, the handouts that are attached in your control panel. So um, part of what Michael's talking through is the process overview PDF that's available there uh, in the control panel. So um, uh, that, that's just something for you as well uh, to follow along uh, with the presentation. Especially yes. multiple monitors, right? Be able to watch that on the other side. And I will pull that in and share that with you shortly. 
um, what that looks like just in case. So, um, But in discovery mode, so whether you're establishing what the process is um, or you're making changes to an already um, documented process, you have to always make sure when you start you understand what the current state is, what is going on today. Um, usually in new process development, it is always advisable to just at least map out how it is currently happening because you gain a lot of understanding and there's a lot of value to that between stakeholders. A lot of understanding is gained and a lot of um, uh, silo breakdowns. Uh, you, you know, you start to get rid of those walls in that process. Um, again, success. If we know what the as is, we know uh, who the stakeholders are, we are also seeing input and buy-in. And you can tell, right, when you're talking to people, when you're engaging with folks and you're inquiring about what their, what their obstacles are, what their hurdles are, um, and you learn what's working, what's not, you get input and buy-in because when you're interested in what people have to say and they actually get to share in that, the buy-in is inherent. Um, one of the, some of the pitfalls in in discovery mode is no ownership. Again, this goes back to that that person who's driving the information. Whether it's at each uh, department level, you need ownership of what's being done, um, and that is where that driver can help identify that and carry that through. Again, politics in discovery, you're going to go and hear what hurts people's feelings, and you're going to hear all kinds of things when you're collecting discovery. Um, you're going to hear about somebody had a bad experience with someone a year ago, but you have to let people get it out. It's part of the buy-in, but you need to avoid getting involved in the politics. Uh, you just need to stay objective. So keep that present of mind when you're doing that. Um, another thing that I've always experienced in uh, process discovery is once people start to see how effective it is, uh, you kind of get, a, it becomes like a, you know, the a runaway train. People really start wanting to solve every single thing they can all at once and it can get, it can get difficult to manage. So um, just being aware that you don't need to solve everything but you need to start at the high level and make sure that you have visible uh, handoff like the relay race and I'll, I'll share that momentarily. But you want to make sure that there that you are covering the process end to end, and that you will in your understanding the as is, and when you first document, you will solve some things, and that's normal. But don't try to go at it at full tilt in the first one because you'll end up in paralysis. Momentum over perfection will get you there. And again, I'm always going to keep reminding: don't take it personally. This is always about continuous improvement and learning to do things better. And when you put that hat on, the the Conversations are always better and more productive. So let's jump to the next step, documentation. The things that are really important for the successful output of documentation are tools, right? So what tools do you use for to collect and collaborate on the process and what tools are you using to deploy and create the availability for your users? So whether you decide to use Microsoft Word or Visio or Outlook emails, Whatever you want, as long as it's consistent and you've defined it, you will probably be okay. Personally, I prefer to use a process modeling tool, and we do. Um, I'm always happy to engage that and, and uh, join other companies, any of our prospects or customers. I'm happy to join their teams and go on site or remotely demonstrate what we use. It's just a way to do the shopping. If you're out looking for tools, there's some great free ones out there. And at the end of this presentation, I will show you a couple of links for resources, but I think you have to have the ability to collect and deploy process where it is easy to understand um, and it's available, part of that easy access and output here. Deployment, we use um, SharePoint 0365 and uh, it, it is very effective. We have it, it's accessible and we have a very visual process that is in, uh, through our change management system. It's always uh, getting updated and um, being current. The other piece of success in documentation is that you actually can show your end-to-end -end process of what you uh, set out to do, and, and at a high level, you need to know who, what, and when. It's, it's, if you stay on that topic, keep it basic, you will make uh, milestones. You will, you will uh, really make a lot of progress very, very quickly. Um, and again, easy access and availability. Back to that whole pre-misconceived uh, notion about what process is, is that it's not just this document that you do once and it sits on a shelf. You need it to be available and accessible so that people can engage, not have to go find it somewhere. It should be right in front of them. And we have links in our ERP system. Um, we have, um, it's just available and in front of everyone all the time. 
Um, pitfalls. One of the things you need to be very careful of and something I've learned again and I want to share is that you can really get into some complexity in process and uh, there's a point at which people start looking at process and if it's too complicated, if you have too many twists and turns and it just seems to go on and on, you tend to lose folks. So you have to, we are always, once we've done that as is, which is usually the most complicated starting point, you work to simplify. So as you look at a process and you start developing it, you want to make sure you're keeping it simple from a high level that somebody could say end to end, I understand it at the high level without having to drill into all the tasks and steps. So you want to make sure you, you, you layer it that way so it's easy. It's easy on the eyes and it's also easy to understand. Um, another pitfall is we also have suffered from this and we are always working to improve and I think SharePoint has been one of the, the ways we're doing that. But we have uh, multiple locations um, that, that we put things in. So we wanted to be very intentional about making sure we have um, uh, consistent locations and dedicated places to put things so that in, in our processes they are all stored in one spot. Again, you want to make sure that it's identifiable as the process. So we don't want, say, market, uh, sales processes in one location and finance processes in another. And the reason for that is keeping it all together makes it accessible to all. It provides transparency and visibility of how the operation of the company runs through departments, um, which speaks to the third one. You need the overall model that will, that will address uh, the silo issue, and it actually helps um, break down those silos and, and enable communication and understanding. Really, totally, the documentation should show a user what happened before I got it and what's going to happen when I give it away. So the handoffs have to be there, and it has to be clear. Um, is, if there's any interjections there before I move on? Yeah, so the only thing I'd say, part of, part of the documentation piece in particular, um, you know, the statistic that, uh, and I just was pulling up some, some data here uh, that's, that's made me worry. I, I've always used the, the percentage of 10%, of but I'm, I'm seeing that uh, it, it depends a little bit, but right around 12% uh, when you're, if you're training on something, so you're taking, here's the process that we go through to do X, Y, Z. Uh, if you just train them on it and you don't document it, um, only 12% of that information is actually learned and applied to their job. So part of our job, part of our job as managers and leaders is, is to enable our team. Uh, and so documentation is one of the ways in which we can increase the retention because there's a point of reference that they can continue to go back to that's easy and uh, easy to access as well as a known source of authority uh, for, the me for the method. So um, that, that's one of the, when, you know, whenever we talk about these things, it's like, well, what problem are we trying to solve here? And part of it is you invest in training your people, but if, if they only retain 12%, how do we increase that? How do we increase the, the odds of them executing uh, successfully and serving your mission or your constituents or your participants or your customers, whatever it is, um, better through documentation and training retention? So that's the only comment I have, Michael. Perfect. Thanks, Nate. Okay, so let's move on to compliance and the third step in the in the uh, methodology here. So with compliance, there is all just as Nate's saying. You know, when you're training folks, it's it's under one of the success things is that you're able to train people, scalable, um, and get people in their seats and doing the right thing faster. Um, and again, we have we've spent all the time and energy putting the process together for folks. It's really nice if they've got a couple of monitors to have the process up on one screen and then they're working in various systems of information um, to, to engage and do their job. So in compliance, we have a couple of different things. We have auditability. So once a process has been um, deployed, an iteration of the process, we have the ability to go and audit. I'll tell you um, the fact that um, I have been so intimately involved with our processes here from the get-go, uh, whenever we see an exception or we see something that erred or an invoice was incorrect or um, something was wrong in somewhere, something hiccuped or it appeared out of nowhere, you get those kind of questions. I am able to, because we have done such an, a, a thorough job of process um, development, I'm able to root cause analysis pretty
pretty quickly. Um, usually if somebody comes to me and says, this is wrong, I can find out within a matter of, you know, a couple of minutes and get to the root cause and go, that's because this didn't occur or this didn't occur. And it's provided all of us that kind of ability here at MyTech. Um, but really to understand compliance um, engagement, right, that's part of a success factor. If you, people, if they're engaged with the processes, your, 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 your chance of, of more compliance is absolutely greater. So as an example, um, so after about halfway through my journey here at my two-year mark, I, I, I love sharing this because it was, I wanted to, to understand how engaged are folks. And I, um, we have a change management system, which I have listed here under success, that I originally created just for process changes. And now we have it that it governs all of our systems and tools using the ITIL uh, change advisory board methodology on change management. But um, in two years, our first two years, we were developing core processes one a quarter as per our um, EOS implementation methodology. And in two years, I had over 400 employee requests. Remember, we started with only 32 or 33 employees. And we grew to, in two years, I think we were at about 60 employees. So we doubled in size in those first two years. And our engagement was 400 requests in two years. I, 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 I can't ex I, I say enough at just how high that engagement really looks. Um, and training, you're, again, I mentioned that auditability is something we do. We can do it um, reactively or just proactively. Go out and we talk to people. How's it going? What are you learning? We engage beyond the development of the process, and we're always open to um, dialogue that might uh, request a review or a measure or a new metric, and we go into change management mode. Success means you have an ability to change. You have ability to audit. You use it for training, and you know you have engagement. If you have these four factors, you are doing it right. You have good compliance. A couple things that I've uh, learned along my journey about pitfalls to avoid, the blinder effect. Um, most of the time, I've, I've, people are, are critical thinkers. You want people to sit in their seat and think about how they do their job, where they can bring improvement, are they meeting our vision, are they giving the best of themselves to our customers. But you also have to avoid the fact that when we have documented things to the degree that we have, you, want, you don't want to have people say, well, I did what the process told me and it broke and then do nothing. So you want to coach. That's the area to coach on. When you're in the process and you have the baton, again, I think of the baton being a relay. Um, and if you're holding the baton and something doesn't seem to move forward, this is where we're really focusing now. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of slides. Um, but it's about being able to handle something outside of the process more than once you've got the processes working in a, in a very uh, consistent way, you have to coach and train on what the exceptions are. You don't want people to be complacent and just do what it says and not think. Then you've got the wrong people in the wrong seats. Um, again, handing the baton backwards is, is really the, uh, the thing that we don't want to do. And this handout that uh, Nathan mentioned that I have in the presentation looks like this. If you ever uh, need a copy, you can email me as well. This is just an overview of what um, we're talking about today, which is some really good highlights for you. If you look at the second page of it, I have this statement on the left. When, you, I, when I present, I roll these up and make them look like a baton. But I think it's key to just note, in a relay race, you never pass the baton backwards. And what I'm saying about that is even when you do an as is, you're going to capture things that go backwards. That is probably more normal than you imagine. But the idea is to improve process, you want to eliminate that. You want to always make sure you're moving the baton forward to get it to resolution or what your desired outcome is, whether it's shipping a product or providing a service or, or you know, completing a, a forms for HR. It doesn't really matter. You just want to move it forward. So... <clears throat> I, I, well, if there's any Michael, other, go ahead, Ethan. Yeah, so the, uh, I was going to say one of the things that I've appreciated about the compliance and the and the you mentioned by the way I, I don't remember hearing that statistic about 400 uh, kind of process change requests or, or improvement requests that have come through in the first couple of years. Uh, that's something that we actually have started uh, reporting on to our team to uh, be the a gauge of of engagement or a, a kind of a baseline, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I love about uh, having it documented and really look at from the compliance perspective is every time we bring on a new person, uh, one of the things that I always tell them, at least on my team, is 
I want you to scrutinize, follow the process, but I want you to scrutinize the process. If it's not clear, if you can't walk through it um, and, and figure out what's next, then, then say something. Raise a hand. Take a screenshot. Send in an email. Because I love it when new sets of eyes, people who aren't as deep, deeply involved as someone who's been with the organization four and a half years or longer, uh, takes a look at our process. And then they're able to, to apply it to their world and find the little gaps that, you know, if you're deeper involved, your mind connects the dots that other people don't necessarily connect if they're new to it. So um, that's something that I encourage. It, it, it's great for my team because it makes them – uh, it really focus on the details and make sure that we didn't miss something and, and then be able to uh, incrementally improve it. So part of the compliance for me, especially when we bring on new people, is engage in the, get them engaging in the change management process right away when they understand that they're enabled and empowered to do that because then uh, that's, that's the way, at least in, in my mind, to – uh, which is, I believe, the segue, Michael. I'm not trying to make a segue for you, but the, I love that compliance because it forces us to dig into change management and, and encourage anyone in the organization uh, to, to seek out and find gaps so that we can close them uh, and improve and improve our instruction and direction and, and, um, and process. Yeah, no, thank you, Nate. I love I love your interjections. But the actually the thing that's interesting. Um, so as you mentioned, our onboarding process for new hires, every new hire um, automatically because we have automated um, many pieces of communication for that consistency. Not only do we want the best IT experience for our customers, but we also want it for our employees. So um, I actually sit down with every new hire and give them an overview of our process methodology. We want them to start in the right mindset, and I also have created a process for change management with training videos that, that everyone's uh, required to watch as a new hire. So we really hit the, the ground running with that mindset around process and being uh, an asset that is living and breathing. It's not just uh, a quarterly training. This is what happens with every new hire as part of that onboarding process. So thank you, Nate, for bringing that up. I'm going to now jump into continuous improvement. It is um, just the other side of compliance. It's like, as Nate said, when things are off, how do we fix them, right? So in continuous improvement, we are always looking for who's accountable, um, making sure that communicating updates in, in continuous improvement are done. So training is ever uh, in the mindset. And Nathan and I, um, you know, when things happen for uh, your department, we, we talk about how are we going to communicate? Is it at a department meeting? Do we need to do training? And so that's always part of whenever there are continuous, when there are uh, improvements or changes to a process, we actually, you know, have to figure out, well, how are we going to deliver this? Is it a one-off? Is it actually something we need to train on? So that is part of making sure that dialogue continues um, and that in, um, in the change, in the system itself, in compliance and continuous improvement, we always want to recognize who is accountable and how that um, plays out in the process. So that goes back to even the more basic who, what, when. And that will always provide the accountability, but you also want to be clear at what that is. Um, pitfalls to avoid. So if we have one of the things, like Nathan said, we are now looking more, more into detail as far as what that engagement looks like. When we don't see engagement in a process and we audit it, that's where you tend to see where some of those gaps are. So you really have to close the gap, change the, make the change request to the CAB team, the change advisory board team, and, and work through with the stakeholders to make sure. So if you start seeing any of these things on the right, you start to go back and audit and in, in make sure that things are what I say is we do what we say we do. So that is really critical. And so I'm going to move into our change management system as it's a real important piece for both compliance and continuous improvement. And this is really, this next screen will just kind of give you a very small flavor of what our process output looks like in SharePoint. But this is a very basic process. And you can see in the drill down here, this is how our output looks. It's very distinct. It's very visual. And really, we have ability to document and template in our system. But our change management process really just shows our staff there's a video that's linked, um, at whether you're a member of the, the Change Advisory Board or if you're a user and need to learn how to submit a change request, you, will, um, you can get your training here as well. But in the process, you can drill down for specific instructions on how to 
manage a change request and how to input it. What does the approval process look like? Um, and how do you go ahead and communicate? We've made it simple because we, we want to build on that simplicity. So that is really where we kind of tie them together and using that, that system that's very visible. The thing that I want to talk about next is this, this phrase that I've coined called sixth iteration. So before you can start getting into your accuracy of metrics and doing all kinds of um, real uh, fancy things with your process, you really want to make sure you have gotten your process to what I call a consistent state. Um, and I, I say the sixth iteration because, again, that four-year college education of really owning process as a full-time responsibility, I have learned that, you know, when you start with that new process at the process out the as is, then you have dialogue, you have a, a foundational piece of which you can bring in the stakeholders, you can tear it apart, you can look at it, but at least you have a, a line in the sand. But once you've done that and you really then go to the second iteration with more improvements and third, generally, and it really does depend on the complexity of the process that you have in hand, but when you get to about six major iterations, it really does seem to plateau, um, provided you don't have changes in technology or systems and things that would upset the, the process. But in a generalized state, you're going to get to about six iterations, and then you're going to be at this nice plateau. And if you're measuring things as far as um, service level targets and things that, you know, how long does it take to turn around uh, from sales to create the order and pass it off to purchasing, et cetera, et cetera. Your accuracy of metrics, as I always state, when your process is consistent, your accuracy of metrics is, is incredibly much more useful. Um, but again, once you've gotten there, you can do things like value stream mapping. We are actually doing some of that now because we have had um, processes that have been pretty stable for a while. Now we're looking at how do we measure for process capacity for improvement and do some value stream mapping. It's really the maturity that we've gotten to. You can probably get there earlier, but I think um, as we went through this and things that we've learned is we wanted to stay true to the core processes and make sure we've we have gotten them optimized to the best of our ability. But this all speaks to the maturation of process engagement. Um, so I wanted just to kind of point that out, that once you really get into this engagement um, flow and, and consistency, you then have all kinds of options to be very good at, at pointing out where your dead spaces are and removing them from the process. So you could take, say, a sales order entry process that normally takes eight business days and easily cut it down to five with value stream mapping and start looking at improvements that way. And it's, um, we're actually going to be looking at doing some of that now, and it's kind of fun. Um, back to my relay thing. Hey, 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 Michael, yes. um, last, last, last thing, could you comment? Because I didn't hear you mention, and uh, how did, you know, when you talk about six, six iterations and things like that, there's, there are lots of options for processes as far as when you look at every aspect of your organization, but how did you choose um, which ones we should focus on? I mean, was there, you know, you know what I mean, uh, was there a, a percentage rule or was there, was there a, uh, I don't know, just how did you kind of identify that the top processes to focus on so that we could get to the sixth iteration on the most important processes the quickest? Okay, so that will go back to my very uh, beginning screens, Nate, when we talked about um, um, the strategy around process. So when we sat down, and maybe I should have mentioned that earlier, but thanks for bringing it up. When I joined MyTech, uh, Leaf, our CEO, and I sat down and we talked about how is the strategy going to be effective and how are we going to do it. So we made a decision based on, on the, the EOS um, um, system that we would take one core process per quarter to identify the as is and get it into its first iterative form. And we started focusing quarter by quarter on one key core process. We stuck to core process as our strategy because it is the 80% of what we do, right? So when we, and that was kind of, I'm speaking to that as well as that coaching piece. When things are outside of that 80%, we're calling those exceptions. So the whole point was to, to understand at a core level, 80% of what we do to get things through the system, whether it's developing a project quote, whether in, and that's one of our core processes of, of really creating a quote we can deliver on for infrastructure changes or, or new infrastructure. Um, our managed services is, is our, our what, what we we do. We provide uh, support and service and 
patching and monitoring to our customers. So our managed services uh, set up and onboarding of managed services customers became a very important core process. Our finance processes, how we invoice and how we do credit memos and how we take deposits for, for hardware and all of those different things became a quarter by quarter review as part of my quarterly uh, um, uh, responsibility to, to LEAF as far as making sure I am doing what I say I'm doing. So we set out with the core process met mentality and determined what each quarter those core processes were and we worked on them one at a time. Does that answer what you're saying, Nate? Yeah, yeah, there's, um, you hit, you hit uh, uh, pretty much everything. The only thing I would say is that I think the, when you, you hit on the core, another way I think that the, uh, the people, a common um, ratio is the 80-20 rule, right? So the core processes that you're talking about were really the, the core 20% of the processes that affect 80% of our operations. So, because um, there's there's lots and lots and lots of processes out there, but you kept using the word core, and that I think I wanted to, that's really the piece I wanted to hit home, is that focus on the core that affects the majority of what you do, and then you can uh, create time and, and have more uh, ability to focus on and get more granular with the other 80% um, as well. So, uh, th thanks, that's, that's exactly what I was looking for. Yes, yes, and I also in my uh, last presentation I talked about Zappos as we have emulated that in culture. The example for their, um, their the, one of the things that's interesting about that scenario is when it was um, the Zappos company under Tony Shea is they have hired a customer service department. 97% of all of their orders and everything are processed behind the scenes, much like how Nate's talking about our 20% of our core processes that manage 80% of our business. Zappos, their customer service team was managing only 3% of what they were doing, but that's what their team was there for. And those were all exceptions of getting that baton over to the finish line. So that is, we're in that same kind of methodology where we consider 80% um, of our people's time is spent on those 20% of exceptions as well. So that's the inverse of that, all right? Perfect, yep, thank you. Okay, so again, I just wanted to state that when you roll up that PDF, there is on the backside in a relay race, you never pass the baton backwards. I think if you always talk to the team and you, t and you, you, you train, you coach, and you, you socialize what process is, you get people to think about it as a relay race. And how do we improve it? We get rid of handing it backwards. And I think fundamentally that is our message, and that is how it is built into our DNA here at MyTech. Um, I did a little research for some recommended reading. I, there's a lot, these are some newer books that are out there that I really found um, pretty helpful uh, in reviewing them. If you're going into this as a new endeavor, arm yourself, educate yourself. I think, um, you know, reading is always a good thing. My first book in process that I read was uh, Leading Change by uh, John Cotter, and that book was published in 1995, but that was my first read into understanding how process and change can impact an organization. Um, this website, this first one, BP Trends, it's based in the UK, uh, very unbiased and very objective reviews and reports on uh, business process modeling tools and things that are out there, great white papers. I highly re recommend it to anyone who is interested. I have also included the Excel users site, and that is Excel, XSOL.com, is actually the provider of the process modeling tool we use. Um, there are other free and cheaper tools out there, but there is, if you drill, if you go to this website where I am, I am actually the president of the user group, I wrote um, just a, a short article about my tech's journey with the tool and why we chose that tool. Uh, if you're interested, I think it's just helpful to always uh, shop around. And if anyone's ever interested in, in a demonstration of the tool, I'm always happy to do that. I'm not here to sell the tool, although we certainly could. I think it just would help if anyone's doing any shopping and be able to do, you know, compare an apple to an apple, so to speak. Um, the final slide that I always like to share is this one. This is what I hold near and dear to my heart. Is a quote by Einstein. You know. This is process for me in a nutshell. If you can't picture it, how are you going to talk about it? How are you going to get people around the table to understand? So pictures are worth a thousand words, and I think a good modeling tool should be able to visually represent the process as well as contain specific ins instructions and standard operating procedures in your drill downs. Um, at that point, I usually ask for any questions. Um, that's our number at MyTech. There's my email address. Um, you know, um, 
I think that that pretty yeah. much covers it. That does, and thank you, Michael. And then um, we'll we'll actually attach uh, we'll we'll take those links and we'll reference those in the follow up email that we'll send out tomorrow, along with the recording of this session. Uh, so with that said, we ran a couple minutes over, but that was probably my fault for interjecting some comments and uh, relative to Michael's uh, presentation. So uh, thank you, Michael and Emily, for your time and putting this information together. And um, signing off, everybody, and uh, stay tuned for the follow up email tomorrow that'll have the link to the recording. Have a great Terrific. day. Thank you.